as we make way for the uh, great baseball writer, reporter, Tom Verducci. He's got the Yankees Orioles tomorrow on MLB Network Showcase, part of the network's day-long coverage on Sunday. There's a new feature uh, that he has on Shohei Otani on SI.com and a new Bryce Harper feature coming out tomorrow. Tom, uh, thanks for joining us. Let me start with Tommy John, the final push. Contributions to the game, if he's not successful after the surgery, then we probably are looking for a different alternative here. So as a baseball Hall of Fame voter, how much can you factor in contributions to the game to go along with winning 288 games? Yeah, I think you have to look at that, Dan. I mean, whether it's a player who's kind of a borderline candidate who goes on to be a manager, I think you look at that. I think you look at pioneers in the game. And you can make a case that Tommy John is a pioneer of the game, although the medical community would say that Dr. Frank Job is the one who's the pioneer. And it's interesting, Dr. Job was such a humble guy. He did not want that surgery, which he pioneered, named after him. That's very unusual in the medical field. I mean, you think about the Jarvik heart and all these kind of breakthroughs in the medical field. The doctor who pioneers it normally has his name on the procedure. And instead, Frank Job was such a humble guy. He said, no, put Tommy John's name attached to that. And you're right. The fact that Tommy John, if he just comes back and, you know, maybe throws a game or two or a year, he actually had a better career, it seemed like, after the surgery. I don't think the impact would be as great. And Besides that, Dan, I mean, looking at his record now, pitching all those years, all those innings, it gets better as the years go by, man. I mean, no one's pitching like half the workload of Tommy John. And by the way, I'm old enough to have covered Tommy John, and I once saw him make three errors on the same play. A pitcher who made three errors on the same play. I mean, I don't know if that gets you in the Hall of Fame, but it's notable. (laughs) He did uh, describe it. I asked him about that uh, half hour ago, and uh, he said, yeah, I bobbled it, threw it away, got the relay, threw it home, and I got charged three errors on one play. Yeah, I mean, 288 wins. I know that we have compilers, but still, you have to be pretty good to win 288 games, to stay healthy enough to pitch and have over 500 decisions and a very respectable ERA and he pitched for big market teams as well. Yeah, I like that point, Dan, because, you know, Jack Morris to me was one of those candidates as well. And I voted for Jack Morris. And people looked at the ERA and said, well, it's way too high. You're not a Hall of Famer. But to pitch that many innings and to be the game one starter for a couple of different teams and obviously the big moments in the World Series. But to me, it was about he's I know wins are not as important as they were, right? We understand a lot more about context. But you still have to pitch enough innings to keep your team in the game to qualify for the win. And if you do that year after year after year, you get 288 of those. So we say compiler like it's an insult. I actually think longevity is a skill. Well, you bring up Jack Morris. I remember uh, a former manager saying he pitched, uh, you know, it didn't matter how many runs he gave up. He, he would be there to pitch. How many innings do you need? Do you need me to go seven innings? He didn't get caught up in my ERA is over four, take me out, or I'm getting blown up here. It was, what do you need me to do? And then I will go out and try to do that. And that's why I always thought, if you're the ace for three different teams, I mean, there's something to be said for that. And I don't know. I guess I, the, the nostalgic part of me looks at Tommy John and says, it's late in life. He's done an incredible thing. Uh, He was successful, won 20 games three times after the surgery. What's the downside of of, uh, putting Tommy John in the Hall of Fame? Yeah, I mean, that's the question I ask. Why not, right? You certainly can make a case for him, but making a case against him, that's hard to do for someone who devoted his life to the game. Um, And yeah, I think he was one of those guys. In today's game, we talk all the time about third time around the lineup, right? These starting pitchers don't even get the chance to pitch third time around. (laughs) Your ERA is going to go up if you pitch, in his case, fourth time around too. Um, But he never wanted to come out of the game. And Jack Morris was the same way as well. I mean, Jack Morris once literally stopped Sparky Anderson in his track. Sparky was coming out to the mound. And before he got to the foul line, which is the second mound visit where you have to come out, Jack Morris stopped him and basically said, get your butt back in the dugout. Whoever you got in the bullpen ain't any better than me. That's old school. No 100 team uh, win teams this year. Is that a good thing? Uh, yeah, I guess you could say because we have more balance. Um, but I think teams like the Dodgers, Dad, have figured out 
that there's really not a great reward for winning like 110 games. You're better off not putting that accelerator to the floor, giving your guys rest, especially your pitchers, not going all out to win a, a boatload of games because you're winning your division and it, they're not there yet. Don't get me wrong, but you win their, your division. You don't get anything extra from winning 110 games. So I think there's a lot of that going on where teams have noticed in the postseason tournament baseball, man, it's like American Legion baseball. The best team isn't going to win. We pretty much know that going in. The hottest team, the one that has breaks go their way in a small sample are going to win. So I think teams have realized, let's go, I don't want to say easy on the regular season, but we're not going to try to win 110 games because we want to get to October with our guys healthy. That's the biggest thing. Yeah, well, you know, the San Antonio Spurs, uh, Greg Popovich made a career out of this. The regular season didn't really matter. Let everybody else have bragging rights. We're going to be ready to go in the postseason. We're talking to Tom. He was Berucci, ahead of his MLB. time, right? Lo load management. He was ahead of his time. We hear that all the time now. But, yeah, you're right. You've got a new feature on Shohei Otani out on SI.com. If I would have told you in March, which number would surprise you more, 53 homers or 55 steals? The steals to me. I mean, I, I thought with this guy's power, I actually thought he had a chance to break the home run record. Uh, maybe not Bonds's, but, you know, the the number by um, by Judge to get over 62, 63, get in that area. I thought that was possible, just the way he was trending and tracking. But these stolen bases, no. Didn't see that coming at all. Didn't think he would run this much as he has. And I know, Dan, people are going to say, well, you know, the stolen bases are easier now with the new rules. Look around the game. Who else is stealing bags at the rate he is? I mean, it's, what, 93 94%, over 50 stolen bases. It's one of the greatest years in baseball history, stealing bases. Uh, so I did not see him running this much. It's probably the result of not pitching. Uh, like, I don't yeah. see him running quite as much next year when he's back on the mound. But this guy, Dan, he he he's actually, there's like 150 guys in baseball, pure speed, who are faster than Shohei. He's not a, a complete burner on the base. He's fast, don't get me wrong. But he's stealing bases because he's smart and gets great jumps. I brought this up uh, earlier this week when we were looking for a comp for Otani with that performance when he had three home runs and, and joined the 50-50 club. And the only other game that I thought of, let, let me take Don Larson out because it was a perfect game, so nothing can be better than a perfect game. And that's Ted Williams at the end of... Uh, his 406 season when he chose to, you know, to play in both games of the doubleheader, he could have rounded up to, you know, 400 at 399.5. But he said, no, I'm going to play. Even after he had gotten over 400, he said, I'm going to play the second game of the no hitter. I find that, you know, comparable to Shohei Otani. What about you? Yeah, that was one of the greatest days ever. And the Red Sox were out of it. The difference here is Shohei's playing on a team that actually clinched a playoff spot in that game when he had the six hits, 10 RBIs, three home runs. So it's it's probably statistically the most prolific offensive game in the history of baseball, given the stolen bases, the home runs, the hits, the RB, all those things, which is like, you know, playing the bingo card. I mean, bingo 20 times over. So I think it is the greatest <laughs> prolific game offensively in baseball history legendary as far as ted goes it probably doesn't top that one uh that probably is like as far as legends go as big as it gets are the white Sox fascinatingly embarrassing or just <laughs> no embarrassing? That, that's the problem uh, I don't know that people are going to be writing books and, and telling tales about the 24 White Sox the way they do the 62 Mets. I don't know if there's anything level about them. They they were just a bad team out of the gate and got worse. Um, and I'm not sure what their future is, but they're a long way from, from really competing. So, yeah, I, I just think that we kind of just dismissed them as a really bad team. But I don't think we were fascinated by them. I, you know, this, this race, so to speak, down the, the stretch with the 62 Mets, I don't think it's captivated anybody. It's hard to be that bad. It is. <laughs> I mean, there, there's been a lot of bad teams, but they're going to end up with more losses than anybody in the history of the sport. And three years ago, it looked like the future was extremely bright. Yeah, I mean, how did it happen? Pitching, they had Rodon, they had Giolito. You know, a guy like Luis Robert was being compared to Mike Trout. Um, yeah, I mean, 
I don't know how it all fell apart so quickly, but the player development system just kind of stopped. There was nothing coming there. Um, it's a good question, Dan. It, it, I agree with you. It's hard to be this bad. The Royals last year lost 106 games, and look where they are this year, right? They're, they may get in the postseason. Um, but I I just didn't see – I don't think anybody saw this level of ineptitude coming. And guys like Ben and Tendi, who are supposed to be good players, just fell off a cliff. Everything went wrong for this team. Give me your World Series matchup if you were picking today. Wow. Um, I like San Diego a lot, Dan. Uh, and my preseason pick was Phillies over the Orioles in the, in the World Series. I shouldn't jump off of that. But if you're asking me which team right now looks the most dangerous to me, it's the San Diego Padres. Uh, in the American League, I would go with the Houston Astros right now for the same reason. I mean, the Astros know how to run the marathon. They know how to get through the season. They started 12 and 24. And here they are. They're probably going to wind up back in the ALCS like they own the joint. And I do think that their pitching, is that's what you look at, right, when you get the postseason, is better than New York's, better than the Yankees. So I, I think to me right now, I would say if I had to pick right now, I'd say San Diego over Houston. Houston doesn't go away. Oh, no. They don't. They, they know what they're doing. Uh, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, for all those teams, all the people who wrote them off at 12 and 24, you know, you just it's like you've seen this with great players, Dan. You always, always give the greatest the benefit of the doubt. And to me, that's Shohei, by the way. You know, I know people are saying he's never played in the postseason before. What's he going to do? Well, let's, you know, wait until we see. What more do you need to see? This guy's playing on a winning team for the first time in his career, and he goes out and has the best September of his life. I mean, I don't know about you, Dan, but I'm looking at this guy, and I think we have to start thinking about Shohei as the greatest living player. I mean, I know it's a mouthful, but I'm not talking about career, but his talent. You've got Griffey, you've got Ricky, you got Bonds, you got Clemens. You know, now that Willie Mays has passed, you know, that mantle is out there, greatest living player. And to me, it really is Shohei Otani. This is a guy who can compete year after year, except for this year he's hurt, for both the Cy Young Award and the home run title. Think about that. The same guy competing for Cy Young and the home run title. Great to catch up with you as always, Tom. We'll talk during the postseason. Thank you. Love it, Dan. Thanks. Tom Berducci, MLB Network, Fox Sports Analyst and Senior Writer for Sports Illustrated, SI.com, a new feature on Shohei Otani and a Bryce Harper feature coming out tomorrow.